So, in Abu, everyone, um, it's time for, for Bible class again today. And today we return to church. So, it's our first stream from church since we started on April the 4th. And it's good that we have lesson 14. So, as we, um, as we get ready to begin today, let's just bow our heads to pray and then we will get into today's message. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for the fact that you have revealed your will to us through the prophecies over the years, and that you continue to speak to our hearts today, guide and direct all of our activities, and may we truly be blessed today as we study your word and be drawn closer to you. Guide and direct this discussion with all those who have loved it, those who are present, those who will soon come in. We pray that you continue to bless us all. As we pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. All right, so today we, we want to continue um, the study of Daniel chapter 8, if you will. And so we will go back to um, our presentation. And even though we will um, do some conversations along the way, we will still use the presentations to guide us. All right, so today we, we want to continue Daniel chapter 8. And we have entitled today's session, The Heavenly Sanctuary in Daniel chapter 8. I think it's important, it's a very, very critical part of the prophecies. We are really now into the heart of the prophecies. And just to remember that Daniel chapter 8 really is one of the, the first of the, the books, a few of the chapters that are written in Hebrew. So for the past, well, you know, the first day, um, chapter 1 was also written in Hebrew, but from chapters 2 to 7, they were written in Aramaic, and they, te- they dealt a lot with um, world events and the events that were taking place, particularly in the Mesopotamian Valley. And now we move into Daniel chapter 8, which is written in Hebrew. And that is extremely significant because the, the, the sanctuary service that we spent some time studying a few months ago, features heavily in Daniel chapter 8, especially towards the end. And that is what we will want to focus on today as we go forward, all right? So we want to pay attention to that. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to the full slide part today, but what we will do is we will take our time. I'm not going to rush it. These are critical truths that we need to appreciate and understand. And then as we go forward, we'll get to the point where we begin to appreciate what God has in store for us. And if we need to spill over it next week, then so be it. All right? So we are continuing, if you will, on our theme that that says God has a plan. And we're looking at the heavenly sanctuary. Let's review some key points. The first key point we want to establish is that we have, we are now very much into the apocalyptic prophecies. We are into prophecies that deal with the end time, which is on the right hand side of our slide. Um, And on the left hand side, we we remember that there are classical prophecies that are related to um, to, the prophets who would have spoken in times that were very unique to their situation. And, And I always use Jonah as a good example. It was very local to him. It was very specific to his local, if you will. And he gave a prophecy that was, was fitting for that particular time. As opposed to the prophecies of Daniel and then later Revelation, they span periods of time all the way from the time of the prophet to the time of the very end. And that, that is a key understanding that when we discuss apocalyptic, apocalyptic prophecies, and in particular when we take a historicist view of the prophecies, we are basically indicating that the prophecy that the prophet receives or that he, he articulates or that he, he writes down for us to review, the prophecy of the prophet spans usually from the time of the prophet to the very end of time. And today that is extremely important because when we study Daniel chapter 8, which we started last week, we started from the time of the Persians, the media Persian empire, rather than from Babylon. But we concluded at the end of time as the other prophecies did. That is extremely significant because 
It is suggesting that this prophecy that we are now looking at in Daniel chapter 8 is some or the other specifically related to a period of time that begins in the, in the media Persian Empire and concludes somewhere towards the end of time. And I thought you just keep that nugget in your head because as we move along, that becomes important. The other thing that we establish very clearly is that both the Old and the New Testament point to Jesus Christ. And I want us to remember that. Both the Old and the New Testament point to our righteousness is obtained by faith in Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross. And that is extremely important, brethren, so that if you are, if you were in Old Testament times, you carried out the sacrifices in the sanctuary on a daily basis, you offered your ram and your lamb, etc., and you carry out your blood sacrifices with the faith that Jesus will one day come and he will die in the place of the lambs and the goats, etc., as a true sacrifice. And given the fact that he will come, the Old Testament believer was able to claim forgiveness of sins. I want to say that again so you begin to understand that faith played an important part in Old Testament times. The Old Testament sinner and believer, as he came to the sanctuary and he offered his lamb to the priest, and the priest would slit the throat and cut the blood and use the blood to sprinkle on the most holy place, in the holy place, sorry, and do this on a daily basis, morning and evening. What we found was that each time the believer is, is by faith accepting that one day a true sacrifice will come. Paul refers to it as the ultimate sacrifice, the real sacrifice. Jesus will come because the blood of goats and lambs cannot satisfy God for our salvation, but the blood of Jesus Christ can. Amen. So that we, we really find ourselves in a situation where we are experiencing by faith in Old Testament times, and then in New Testament times, and in our day, we look back in faith and say, because Jesus died for me, my sins are forgiven. I don't have to do penance. I don't have to do any laborious thing. I don't have to pay no sort of money to the church. I do those things because I am saved, not to be saved. Those are fundamental truths that we will return to later on in our lesson today. And then we, we return to our critical view of how prophecy is viewed. And we said that there are four approaches to prophecy. One is called pre-theism, that assumes that everything has already happened in the past. One is called futurism, that assumes that everything will happen in the future. One is called idealism, that says none of this thing is real. It's all um, analogous to good versus evil. It's all a alleg uh, big allegory. It really doesn't represent anything real, but it's reflecting good versus evil in the world. And then the one that we have accepted and subscribed to, and it is indeed a traditional view of prophecy by all the biblical scholars, is the one called historism, which basically says that we are um, accepting the fact that the prophecy revealed in the Bible unfolds throughout the period of world's history, and more so from the time the prophecy is given all the way down to the very end of time. That is the approach. Now, I have been repeating this slide over and over again, and I want to suggest to you that the, the, the study of Daniel chapter 8 is particularly impacted by these four views. There are people who have a preterist view of Daniel chapter 8 and assume that the little horn that we are studying today in a little bit more detail, they assume that that little horn was a king that came in some early years, around 65 BC. So they assume that he was a king from then, and therefore, once he had completed his stuff, the prophecy was only applicable to him. You begin to appreciate that if you took that view, this is a pre-theism view, then you lose the rich interpretation that we are going to go through today that is classical historism. And that is a challenge. So that when you find that you discuss 
the, the prophecies of Daniel with your colleagues of other faiths, etc. You need to be sure what, which one of these lenses, if you will, are they looking at the prophecies true? Are they using a historicist lens as we are doing? Or are they using a pre-theism lens or a futurism lens to tell you all these things will happen in the future? And, I said, and, I, and I'm very clear that there are different interpretations that are very, very popular and contemporary in our society today, but it's all based on which lens we are using. And that is the value of this going forward. We, we also identify that while there are narrative stories in the book of Daniel, there are also prophetic chapters, and we are very much into the prophetic chapter of Daniel. So Daniel chapter 8, where we encounter more dreams and beasts and the heavenly sanctuary is where we want to focus on today. All right? Um, again, I, I gave you, this is a contemporary modern-day map of Europe, and we are very accustomed to this map. We see Spain to the, to the western side. We see Turkey to the eastern side. We see Italy and Greece in the middle there. Um, and these are modern day European countries, but these are countries with rich histories that tie their, their origins, if you will, if you could use the word origins, because you know, you don't want to say that they started only in the Roman Empire because they existed in the other empires. But they had their genesis, they had their, their real significant um, impact on world history during the period of the Roman Empire. So that this is primarily what we have drawn a circle on here is really meant to show um, Rome, if you will, and, and, and the existence and the extent of the Roman Empire. The important thing to note is that the Roman Empire will have, um, have its surroundings around the Mediterranean Sea. And so to a large extent, it's referred to as the Mediterranean Basin. And this is the area um, within which a lot of what we are studying in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 7, in terms of the, the geographical wars that are taking place. And, and today I want you to, um, I want to introduce within your thinking um, horizontal wars and vertical wars. By that I mean that sometimes when we study the prophecies of Daniel 7 and 8, we are at times discussing horizontal wars, wars between nations. And then at some stage, we saw it in Daniel chapter 7 when we looked at the little horn, and we review it today when we look at the little horn again in Daniel chapter 8. There is a vertical war, which is a war between a kingdom on earth and the kingdom of heaven. And just keep that in your mind. So I'm saying to you that there are, there are periods when we study the prophecy and we are only discussing horizontal wars, meaning wars that occur on earth. And that is the context in which I use the word horizontal. But there are periods, however, when the prophecies are describing when earthly kingdoms are at war with God himself. And so in Daniel chapter 7, we talked about a little horn that would trample the saints of God for 1,260 days, which we interpret that to be 1,260 years. That was clearly a fight between a kingdom on this earth and a kingdom of God. But of course, it is not a direct fight with God. It is a proxy fight to the people on the earth. Let me just talk a little bit about proxy fights. You remember that in the story of David and Goliath, the Philistines came and they said, we have a champion. His name is Goliath. He's over nine feet tall and he will come and fight your best champion. And so David became the proxy of the Israelites and Goliath became the proxy of the Philistines. The fight that they both will have will determine the outcome of the battle between the two nations, even though the two nations themselves were not physically at war. So I'm suggesting to you that when the earthly kingdoms fight with God's people here upon earth, it is not, the, 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 the prophecies do not just depict it as a horizontal battle between people on earth. It is saying that when you attack God's people on this earth, you are really attacking God in heaven. Because the people on earth are a proxy for God in heaven. Is that okay? 
And once you begin to appreciate that, then you begin to realize the seriousness of when an earthly kingdom goes to war with God's people because God is suggesting that he is not pleased when you attack my people, you have effectively attacked me. And therefore, I, I, I hold that in a very bad way. So, so this is what we saw earlier was modern day Europe. This is Europe in ancient times. So it is very much familiar, same kind of um, definition and land area. But of course, we are seeing the, the various nations, etc. We went on to talk about the fact that Rome would have been divided into two halves, if you will. Um, not, of course, precisely in terms of, of area, but, but in terms of political importance, it was two halves. It was Western Rome, where Italy would have been kind of the center of that, and, and it was, they were speaking Latin. And then you had Eastern Rome, where Turkey would have been at the center of that. And they were speaking more Greek. At that time, um, we were talking about Istanbul, which is modern-day Istanbul, as Constantinople, which would have been the capital of Eastern Rome and where most of the emperors would have established. And, it, and again, the reason we, we, have, we have emphasized this slide is because we wanted to be very clear that when we talk about the destruction of Rome, a lot of people um, implicitly and subconsciously, if you will, are, they are talking about Western Rome. So in the fifth century, 476 to be exact, um, Western Rome would have been fully overrun by the barbarian tribes. And some people would say, well, that was the end of the Roman Empire. It was the end of the Western Roman Empire, and it was the end of the civil um, arm of the Western Roman Empire, because Rome continued as a nation all the way up to 1453, when you had the Ottoman Turks would have been invading Constantinople. 1517, when Martin Luther would have been posting his 95 theses on the wall. All of that, Rome is still in control, and Rome is still in existence. And that continued, the one would argue, all the way up to 1798, when during the French Revolution, eventually the Roman Empire was overrun, when the Pope was then seen as the head of not just the church, but the nation of Rome was captive and put into prison by General Berthier as part of Napoleon's French army, all right? So, so that is the context in which we keep reemphasizing this because I want to deconstruct in your mind that Rome is in, in, its, in its two phases, if you will, that while Western Rome would have gone through some demise, Eastern Rome prospered to the extent that by 538 AD, the Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian, he granted the Pope who was then on the West um, civil power in addition to, to religious power. And that is why I coined the term in this Bible study, religious political Rome. I know a lot of you are accustomed to calling people Rome. Just bear with me because I think it is more um, it conveys a lot more when we talk about religious political Rome because we need to appreciate that at that stage, Rome had both church and state merged together in the form of the, the Pope or the head of the Roman church who then would have carried out most of the, the, uh, the, the wishes and the directions of the Roman Empire. What is also important, and that will become important when we go through um, Daniel chapter 8, verses 8 to 12, and then 23 to 25 to eight. What is also important is that in order to give life to the religious leader in Western Rome, the, the, the Justinian didn't just give him civil power in terms of laws and letters, but he also gave him the armies that were in Rome so that they would come under his control. And that's extremely important. If you're going to be a leader, then you should have not just in name only, but in authority. So you're going to command the army to be in charge of the forces so that when you wish to carry out the directions of the state, they will listen to you as their commander in chief, if you could use the modern day too. All right, so, so to effect, the, to effect the, the political stature of the church in Western Rome, 
they received um, political support and civil support through the armies of Rome, the legionaries, etc., that were now aligned to the Pope in the West. And later on, it became even bigger as the centuries went on. The church's influence extended all the way to the East, to all of Rome, to the extent that it became synonymous to assume that the head of the church was the head of the Roman Empire. Because all the other kings, we talk about Leo and Gregory and the others, who had to beg the Pope for pardon, etc. All the other kings and all the other emperors had to take their direction from the church. And the church's influence was significant and drove um, influence throughout all the world. All right, we, we talked about the fact that the Christian church would have um, arisen in Judea, a small part of Rome, but it rose to such an extent that it filled the whole earth. All right, so that was just a, a brief review up to that point. Any questions? I will take them as we go along. Um, we have some of our people monitoring YouTube and Zoom as well as those who are in the audience here today, right? Um, so, so in Daniel chapter 7, again, continuing our review, I, I want us to just appreciate that this was the, um, the last of the Aramic chapters. And this one, while it focused, well, well let's talk about it. What we saw in this chapter was that um, there, were, there were significant parallels in this chapter to what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. So in Daniel chapter 2, we saw this, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, he saw this image of a man that was made of different metals, if you will, a multi-metallic man. And on the basis of that, and the interpretation given by God himself to Daniel, we know that the head of gold represented Babylon, and then all the nations have succeeded him. And historically, we have established that the nations that succeeded him, succeeded Babylon, were Media, Persia, Greece, headed by Alexander the Great in the first instance, and then later by um, his four generals. And then the Romans came after by 168 BC, just before Christ. The Romans were really in their dominance and their control to the extent that when Christ was born, we are told that Caesar Augustus ruled the world. And we talk about Tiberius, etc. And then the Romans would have basically um, as their center of, of, of their kingdom lying in the west around Italy and Greece, etc. The Romans would have continued for a number of centuries. Um, just after Christ died, the Romans were in charge. They introduced a period called Pax Domino, where they introduced a peace period and this gospel spread like wildfire because people could travel freely and talk about different religions, etc. And so Christianity and the disciples um, really spread very, very quickly because of the Roman Empire and the peace that they brought to civilization at that point in time. What, what we then knew, well, what we now know, of course, is that the Roman civilization by the fifth century had gone through a demise but it continued in the West. But what grew out of the demise in the, in the West, the East, sorry, what grew out of the demise in the West was the Christian church. And I say that word cautiously because last week I told you that there were two versions of the Christian church. There were the true believers who maintained the Bible and the Bible only and followed what the apostles had to say. And then there were the Christians who had come up especially after the influence of Constantine in 313 AD, where they had true syncretism and emperor worship. They had so um, modified the Christian religion that in effect the Christianity that they proposed was, was defined as Roman Christianity or the Roman Christian church, separate and distinct from the true believers. And we also said that true believers were persecuted. There are writings in a lot of books, especially in Great Controversy by Ellen White, where they talk about the fact that people were um, persecuted and thrown in caves and in dungeons, and that people were thrown to the stake to be burnt, they were eaten by animals, etc. All of these people who were persecuted were God's people. 
All right, we'll be people who follow the true belief of God. And then we said that as the church prospered and it really developed and it, it really gained its prominence in 538 AD, when the church would have true alignment with the Eastern Roman Empire, would have been able to destroy the third of the barbarian tribes, the Ostrogoths, so that they would have destroyed the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Huguenai, so that they became extinct as a result of the Roman Church becoming popular. That Roman Church is the Roman Catholic Church. If we know today, it's still being called as the Roman Catholic Church, and we still carry a lot of the beliefs. But I told you that way back then, that would have been the only Christian church except for the true believers, because we have not yet got Luther Martin, Luther in 1517, who would have then spurred Protestantism and have all these various branches of Christianity that we experience today. So that is the history of, of Daniel chapter seven. Um, but, but, but let me just say that inside of there, we encountered almost a, a kind of vignette, a special story that occurred around a judgment scene in heaven. And we'll do a quick review of that as we go forward. All right, so, so this is Daniel sleeping and he is having a dream of the four beasts. He sees a lion, he sees a bear with three, um, three bones in its mouth. He sees a leopard with four heads and then he sees a beast that cannot be identified, but it has 10 horns around it, which are the 10 nations that effectively barbarian nations have invaded Rome. And then out of those 10 horns, three came down and, and a little horn grew up, which is what we talk about, is the religious political Rome, the Rome that was then run by the head of the church, the Pope, the Pope who, Pontiff Maximus, which was an emperor name that was ascribed to the head of the church. And so he was known as a Pontiff, and later on known as a Pope, which became a, um, a derivative, if you will, of that name, all right? And, and if we then follow that sequence, he says that the first kingdom was Babylon, and I was represented by the head of gold and a lion with wings, yet we defining its swiftness and how it moved. He then said that the, the nation, I'm repeating again because repeating is a good way of making sure it sticks in your memory. Um, we then had the media Persians, which are represented by the breast and the arms of silver and the lopsided lion with three. Um, bones in its mouth is represented the nations of Babylon, Lydia to the north, and Egypt to the south as part of its conquering to become powerful. We had Greece, which is depicted more by the four heads, which are the four generals who came after Alexander, because Alexander's reign was very short. By the time he was 32, he had died of what looked like some sort of influenza, interestingly. And then we have Greece. Um, represented there. And then we had civil Rome, which a lot of times we talk about as having um, continued until 476 BC. And then I told you that there was a religious political Rome that emerged out of there, a little horn, if you will. So you had some of these kingdoms go before Christ, up to Greece anyway. And by the time we got to Rome, it existed before Christ and after Christ as well. All right? So the significant point in that um, description of the kingdoms of the earth in Daniel chapter 7 is the emergence of a little horn from the fourth beast or in the fourth beast. And that is, that is extremely important eh? because when we get to Daniel chapter 8, if you adopted the preterist thinking and you felt that the little horn in Daniel chapter 8 is some little king that occurred just before Christ, then it does not line up with what we had studied in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we are very, very clear that the little horn emerges from the big beast itself, meaning that the little horn is a variant of, of civil Rome. It has all the um, characteristics of civil Rome, it, it becomes a powerful nation under civil rule, but it is different because it has eyes in its head and it speaks like a man and it persecutes the people and it, it, it actually vaunts itself against the heavens. Those are significant characteristics and we were very, very clear that that represented religious political rule 
as they fought um, the little horn of the fourth beast in the Roman Empire. All right, so we were very, very clear about that. I hope everybody is okay with that. This is still summarizing and still reviewing where we are so far. We then said that there, there is a story within the main story of Daniel 7. It's a story with a judgment scene. We see an ancient of days, and we were very clear that the ancient of days represented God, the Father, who functions as a judge. So he, he actually sits. And by the way, from a sequencing point of view, this judgment scene, if you remember when we read Daniel chapter 7, this judgment scene came after the conversation about the little horn will persecute God's people for a time and times and half a time. All right? I think that is extremely important to remember that, that the sequence within which we hear about um, this judgment scene as it's introduced from a sequencing point of view, and if you just take that for what it's worth, it, it, is, it is occurring just after the conversation about a little horn who persecutes God's people for a time and time and dividing of times. It almost seems to suggest that this um, the time period of this judgment is somewhere um, before the end of time because it is occurring before Christ eventually comes because it says in the judgment scene that judgment will be given to the saints of God, which are the people of God, of course. Um, but, it, but it is occurring before Christ comes and it seems to be occurring after the period of 1260 years domination by the little horn. Well, by now you are very versed by the students. You know that at time and times and half a time equals 1,260 days, which if we use Ezekiel 4, 6 and numbers, we know that a day is equal to a year in prophetic reckoning. And therefore, we are already talking about 1260 years. And we know that 1798 was the period in which the Pope was captured. And that lines up very well. If you went back 1260 years from 1798, you end up at 538, which is exactly the year that the Ostrogoths were destroyed <coughs> by the Roman Church. And Justinian gave the Pope or the head of the church. Um, civil power in addition to his religious powers. It lines up well. If we, if we accept that, then basically what we are saying is that this judgment scene is going to take place somewhere before Christ comes or the world comes to an end, but sometime after the 1260 year period. That is a key, key connection. So we go back to our slide and it says that we saw an ancient of days or a judge who sits and he begins the judgment and he sits and books are open, etc. Um, we begin to appreciate that the judgment is not a secret judgment. All the heavenly beings, he sees thousands upon thousands being taken part. But, but the, the effect is that it is taking place in heaven. Um, books are open. The judgment seems to affect the little horn and the other animals. In other words, the, the, the way it is written in Daniel chapter 7, it seems to suggest that the judgment brings an end to the reign of the little horn and the other beasts that went before because they are all destroyed at the end. But let me just be clear that in the vertical war, that's why I talk to you about horizontal wars and vertical wars. In the vertical wars, the, 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 the kingdoms of earth are fighting with the kingdom of God in heaven. And they're doing that through God's people here upon the earth. And in fighting with God's people, the fight is a twofold fight. So I am, I'm giving you a hypothesis, which I'll obviously um, support as I move later on. I just accept it for what it is for now. The fight is a twofold fight. It's a physical fight where people are persecuted, thrown to jail, uh, burned to the stake, sent to animals. But it's also a spiritual fight because what they then do is that they we saw that with the little horn in Daniel chapter 7, in that in, 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 in um, vindicating and rising himself to the point where he sees himself like a God upon the earth, 
he almost challenges the rule of God upon his head and substitutes the rule of a man instead of rule of God. And then the true syncretism, as we discussed, and apostasy, he would have introduced theories and, and beliefs and practices within Christianity that had yet no grounding whatsoever in the Bible. If you don't believe me, check what Martin Luther did in 1517. And so as a result of that, the battle was also spiritual because as people became more and more acclimatized and accustomed to the traditional teachings of the church as opposed to the biblical teachings of the church, they felt as if the traditional teachings were more sacrosanct. They represented the truth and the biblical teachings were forgotten. And by the way, um, before the printing press that came up in the seven, late 1700s or 1800s, people had very little access to Bibles. And if you were to translate Bibles as we saw with Wycliffe and others, they were persecuted because they translated the Bible for other people to read because it was assumed that only the church, the priests, could read the Bible and translate on behalf of the people. And in that regard, the, the priests therefore took on roles that are very similar to our God upon the earth. And I want us to just appreciate that. The battle is both spiritual as well as it's physical. Um, God vindicates, of course, the persecuted saints because in this battle between good versus evil, between, between those who serve the biblical truths versus those who serve man-made truths that are, are intertwined with biblical truths, where you now pray to a woman to get to Jesus, his so-called mother, even though she's dead. And so you, you find that that creates all kind of perversions of the Bible and its truth to the point where it's almost like God is on trial. And so God has to look, if, 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 if two of us stood up here and claimed to be Christians and we both are well-dressed and come to church, then you really don't know who is a true Christian until you examine our lives. And so by examining the lives of the believers, God has a sense of who are those who really represent and follow him. Because by then everybody is being called Christians and everybody will say that they are Christians. But the real Christians are the ones who follow the word of God and live according to Jesus Christ and the Bible. Is that okay? And then one of the other things we encounter is that in this prophecy or in this segment, we encounter the Son of Man. He's introduced. And we know that the Son of Man, Jesus himself, referred to himself in Matthew as the Son of Man, represents Jesus Christ. And so he is, is seen as somebody who's involved in our judgment, and he's the one who stands in our place. Matthew matter of fact, John later on says that we have an advocate, lovely word, an advocate in Jesus Christ who stands on our behalf and administers on our behalf. So let's keep going. If we, if we accept the, the judgment scene, then based on what I argued a little while ago, I am suggesting to you that, that sometime after the 12, 60 years, but before the end of time, there is a judgment in heaven. Is that okay? That is what we have inferred from Daniel chapter seven. That our sequence has now been extended and interrupted to include a judgment that takes place in heaven uh, between the ancient of days and the son of man heavily involved. And then we have God everlasting kingdom when he comes a second time. Is that all right? So that is the sequence that is before us. Um, and we want to recognize that there is heavenly activity. Everybody okay so far? Still reviewing, still reviewing, but we're going, right? And our in-person in audience have increased a little bit. But we're going down the road. All right. So in Daniel chapter 8, um, having looked at Daniel chapter 7, which we did a few weeks ago, now we, we started last week to look at Daniel chapter 8. We encounter four winds, which we said winds from Revelation tells us are strife and represent people. So there are four winds of, of, of strife within out of war, we have um, kingdoms that are established. And then out of one of them, and that was a big conversation because the way it is written in Daniel chapter eight, verse nine, 
And it says out of one of them, those people who believe in the preterist view, they assume that out of one of them means out of one of the generals of Alexander. And that is how they can make this connection to an earthly king who existed just before Christ to suggest that he is a little one. However, when you may rely on the linguistics, people who have studied Hebrew and the construction of the text, etc., and the fact that the nouns have and the pronouns have masculine and singular orientations, as those of you who have done Spanish or French know that your nouns and your verbs of masculine and singular um, classifications. They realize that that out of one of them really meant out of one of the four winds, meaning out of one of the cardinal points, east, west, north, or south. And in this case, it was out of the west, which is where the Romans came, that we have a little horn arising. Now, let me just say to you that when we get to Daniel chapter 8, the use of the little horn is really meant to just talk about Rome alone. Not in not civil Rome and then papal Rome or religious political Rome. It just means all of Rome. All right? And that's something that we studied last week and we'll come back to that. But then Daniel chapter 8 introduces um, two other topics that we didn't touch last week, which is where we're going to focus on today. That is, the sanctuary is attacked. And it also talks about the sanctuary is purified. Now, let me say from the onset, that when we talk about the sanctuary in Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, there is a real temptation to think about the earthly sanctuary. But if you think about the time period that this prophecy is covering, because Rome existed for a number of seven centuries after Jesus Christ. So if we're talking about Rome, as attacking the sanctuary, then I want to suggest to you that this is more than just the earthly sanctuary, because with Christ's death, the earthly sanctuary and its services came to an end. Remember, we discussed the fact that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, which kind of signified the end of the Jewish sanctuary services, so that if Daniel is telling us about the sanctuary being attacked and people being trampled on and stuff, then clearly he's talking about the heavenly sanctuary because, and we're not surprised at that because when we studied the sanctuary services a few months ago, we, we read a text in, in um, Exodus chapter 25 where God said, build me a sanctuary. And then we also discussed the fact that it was supposed to be a pattern as for the one in heaven. Is that okay? So we are very, very um, convicted, if you will, that the, the, the earthly sanctuary, the earthly wilderness sanctuary was a replication, or if you want to say it represented a, a pattern of the sanctuary in heaven. Is that all right? And that a lot of what is being discussed here as the sanctuary is attacked if you keep that in your head, then when we get to analyzing those, those verses, we may very well find that we are talking more about the heavenly sanctuary than the earthly sanctuary. So that is what we want to focus on today. I, wanna, I want you to keep this slide in your head because this is what sort of represents what we've been discussing so far. In Daniel chapter 2, we talked about Babylon, media Persia. Greece, Rome, and then at the end we said there was a supernatural destruction at the end, which was a stone that was full, they cut it out hands and full the hole. Everybody remember that? Right, and then in Daniel 7, again through the various animals, we encountered Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, a two-phase Rome, side off the beast with ten horns, and then evolved into a little horn, but the end was still a supernatural destruction at the end. Is that okay? What this slide doesn't show is that there should be a judgment scene as well. But I deliberately didn't show that because I just want to make the parallel so far between the chapters. Is that all right? In Daniel chapter 8, we did not start with Babylon. 
we stand up at our boat with two horns. Remember that? One higher than the next. And then a ram that move upon him with, with real speed and color because they, um, it had a, a heavy um, horn in its front, which was destroyed. And then um, four horns grew up after it, right? So we started with the Media Persian Empire. We went to Greece, which was by Alexander the Great. And then we went to Rome, and it was just all we did described Rome more was as a little horn. And that was what the supernatural destruction at the end came after. Everybody okay with that? So that is the sequence that is represented in these chapters. Everybody okay with this? All right. I want to review one more thing before we go forward. I want to talk a little bit about biblical salvation. So, you remember this slide? We said that the wages of sin is death. And when we discussed Adam and Eve, when we were talking about the parable, the sanctuary, sorry, we said that once Adam and Eve sinned, once they gave in to the temptation from the devil, and they followed what he said versus what God said. They got themselves into a tango, and the tango was, you know, like he said, an entanglement. That seems to be a big word these days. But I ain't getting into that, right? So they got themselves into an entanglement with the devil, and they found themselves separated from God as a result of that. I mean, that was clear. God put them out of the garden, you know, how to go through hardship, etc. Sin entered to the world. Is that okay? So, so the first and the most predominant aspect of um, sin and, and, and disobeying God is that it creates a separation between God and the sinner. Is that okay? So that if, if God has to um, reconcile, I will use the word of the Bible, reconcile man back to himself, then something has to happen to allow sin to no longer be an issue so that God can reconcile man back to himself. Is that all right? And so that is when we say that the wages of sin is death because God's law said, that is what he told Adam and Eve, if you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. And that wasn't the, the, the temporary ephemeral death where we go to sleep for a while and we are awakened in the resurrection. It was a permanent death, meaning permanent separation from God. Is that okay? So, so, so by sinning, Adam and Eve were now entitled to death. And I want to suggest to you that the only way, because God cannot change and God's law cannot change, the only way God could, remember, remember Daniel, I told you that Daniel has given us good insight, because in Daniel chapter 6, when the king Darius found out that they had plotted against Daniel so that he could continue to worship, even though they had this law, the man said to him, you can't change your law. And that was an example of what has happened to Adam and Eve. So he had to throw them, throw Daniel into the lion's den, and an angel came and see the lion's mouth. Is that okay? So that he went through the death experience, but he came out on the other side alive. Is that all right? In the case of mankind, we are condemned to death because of sin, but Jesus Christ paid the price for us. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, and that's why he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's a powerful statement. Because Jesus is basically saying, I am now experiencing a separation from God, something he had never done for all eternity. And I want to suggest something none of us have ever done. So the death that Jesus experienced, which I like to refer to as the second death, is a kind of permanent death that is a, a, a lion's death experience. It was, there was no coming back. But God resurrected him three days later. Is that okay? And in resurrecting him, his victory over death means that he has done two things. He has paid the price of mankind, but he has returned to being God so he could intercede between God and us and bridge the separation that came from sin. What do you want to do that? The separation that came from sin, Jesus Christ bridges that because he's a resurrected Savior who came out of a death experience 
is now resurrected into eternal life. And he acts as a bridge. So when they father, and this is well documented in Paul and his writings, we'll talk about some of that later today. When the father looks upon you and me, and he says, you are a sinner, or you and I, we are sinners, we say yes. And then we say, but Jesus died for us. And because Jesus did not sin, his righteousness stands in place of our sinfulness. Is that okay? So we come before God not on the basis of what we have done. That's why I'm, I'm very worried that people feel they can earn their place with God and earn their place in heaven by doing good works. God is not interested in your good works to earn you a place in heaven. What he's interested in is that you claim the promise of salvation through Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. And by simply claiming, that's what Martin Luther came to realize in the day, just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17, because he realized that he didn't have to do any penance or anything like that. He simply had to accept the fact that Jesus died for him. And that brought him into a reconciled relationship with God where the separation is gone. Having been reconciled, having come to God and been now one with God and back in his arms of safety, then my only response could be to do what God wants. Is that okay? So I do good things, not to be saved, but because I am saved. And that, that what, what, what Paul then tells us is that Jesus imputes righteousness into us. And as we continue to live for him, he imparts righteousness. So after a while, Paul says, I live, Galatians 2, yet not I but Christ lives within me. Is that okay? Those are fundamental truths. It means that each day, when I get up in the morning and I ask God to guide me, I am assuming that Jesus is somewhere in heaven listening to my prayer, accepting my petition, and presenting me before God as covered by his blood. Is that okay? In a way, Jesus is now our high priest. And that's exactly what Paul said. He says in Hebrews chapter 4, for we have a high priest who was seven in all points as we are yet without sin. But that is not a, 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 a casual or a, 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 a by the way reference. Paul is being very deliberate because the Old Testament priest, by administering each day in the sanctuary, he represented the sins of the people before God in the, in the holy place. And they are basically making a point that Jesus does the same for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Is that okay? So, so let's keep on going, right? So Paul then says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Meaning that nobody can earn their pick and try to be better than God. But, but the gift of God is Jesus Christ's son. Is that okay? Is a text or everybody knows. But it ends by saying that whosoever, that's the only criteria, the only criteria to be reconciled with God from the separation sin has brought on is to believe. Imagine that. No penance, no glory, no big money to bring to the church, no asking people to help you, to let you help them so you can earn your pick. This is not social reform. God simply says if you believe, then you have a chance of, of coming to me. And then in Romans 1 16 and 17 he says, I am not ashamed, this is of course a, a, a translated version, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. This is what Paul is saying, right? First to the Jew, because Jesus of course went to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles, everybody, saying everybody falls under the banner of, of accepting Christ. And then he continues, he says, for in the gospel, a righteousness from who? From God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. In the King James Version, it says from faith to faith. In other words, Paul is saying that God gives us righteousness. We have the view that we must bring righteousness to God and ask him to pardon us because we are righteous. 
but he just said to us, all have sinned. So we cannot earn righteousness. We have to get righteousness from God. Is that all right? And then he concludes by saying, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Then it, the, 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 the slide says, when you believe in Jesus' death by faith, it is that faith that leads you to trust God more and more. Is that okay? That's why Paul later on says in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please God because you must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. Is that okay? So that faith, therefore, we, we have life and we are called righteous through that faith. So, so really, I want to emphasize how simple Christianity is. Anybody could believe in Jesus Christ. And be saved. You gotta be rich or poor, you gotta be a strong man or a weak man. You simply have to have a mind enough to say, I believe in what Christ has done for me, right? This is what Paul says in Corinthians. This is important in understanding the sanctuary being attacked. He says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's this constant constant reference to the fact that our righteousness comes from God. Is that all right? And then he uses a big term, grace, which is unmerited favor. That's what it means. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So this is important, eh? This is important. You could take this text on Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and just read it again during the week. Because you see, the only way to Christ and salvation is to accept Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Believe in Jesus Christ. Confess our sins. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to, to forgive us. And then verse, and then four, decide to follow God. Is that okay? Behold, I said, do I knock if any man hear my voice? That is what Revelation 3.20 means. These are the only steps to salvation. Nothing else. So I begin to ask, if, if your Christian church is not teaching and preaching these steps, then something has gone wrong. Is that okay? And that is an important thing because once, once these steps are obscured, then the simple path to Jesus Christ is obscure. And for God's mind, that is tantamount to an attack on heaven, because you're attacking access to Jesus Christ. Receiving Jesus Christ, we receive the gift of eternal life. So this is what Paul says. I quoted the first one for you already. I'm crucified with Christ. Well, that word crucified, Paul is saying, myself, who I am, dies to Jesus Christ. And then he says, nevertheless I live, yet not I but what? Christ lives within me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he says in Corinthians, this is another favorite text of mine, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? A new creature. The, the, the literal translation means a new creation. What makes us new again? All things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And all things are of God, which have, who had reconciled us to himself. By whom? Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the bridge between separated man and God. Is that okay? And Jesus bridges us and brings us together. But finally, I want to just remind you, he that had the Son had life, and he that had not the Son of God had not life. These things I have written unto you, that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So there's just a brief interlude about how salvation is accomplished. And at the center of salvation is who? Jesus Christ. So I want us to appreciate that if you or I do anything 
to obscure Jesus Christ and block Jesus Christ, then we are not allowing others to access the glory of God. Is that okay? Our, our, our role as witnesses is to tell people about Jesus Christ. Not about ourselves. There's a narcissistic tendency to talk a lot about what we have done. That's not what God is about. He's saying that we need to talk about Jesus Christ. So the fundamentals of our religion must also talk about Jesus Christ. Okay. So I think now we want to get into... There are two passages of scripture that are extremely important. Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 to 14. And then the interpretation of that came in the dream itself. In Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 to 25. So we want to take those two passages together. Is that okay? So just as a refresher, even though I know a lot of you have been reading this thing during the week as I asked, but I'll read it out anyway. Verse 9 to 14 says, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, out of one of them, out of one of the winds, right? Remember that? Came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south. I see direction which it grew. To the south, to the east, and towards the beautiful land. You can imagine that. It grew until it reached, so all the time it growth seems to be horizontal. You okay that? But when we get to verse 10, we start to talk vertical now. It says, it grew until it reached the host of the heavens. Who are the hosts of heavens? We need to talk about that. Who are the hosts of heavens? And threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled upon them. Let's think about that. It set itself up to be as, a, as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. Who is the commander of the army of the Lord? Jesus. It's Jesus. The in-house team is answering very well, right? So Jesus is the army of the Lord. But we'll come back to that. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord. And his sanctuary was thrown down. Verse 12. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. So this is a real power that seems to be emerging out of the fourth um, beast, if you will. This is a fourth beast of Romans chapter 8, well, the third beast of Romans chapter 8. Because this is after the ram and the goat. So this is after media Persia agrees to get Rome. And he's saying that he was like a little horn. So he's still a kingdom. He's making a reference, calling him horn. He's making a reference to Daniel chapter 7. Is that okay? So we can get a, a parallel drawn one time. Then I heard one holy one. So the vision is going on. And Daniel sees all these things. But then he, he gets into... Um, audio only. So then he says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling of the Lord's, of the Lord's people, underfoot of the Lord's people. Verse 14, he said unto me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. All right? We're going to spend the next few minutes going over this passage, but doing it line by line and trying to find some value in what we are discovering. Is that okay? Are you all ready for the journey? If you're at home and you have your Bible, you can open it and keep it on that passage, but we'll bring it up on the screen as well. And we'll try to go through. So this is a key part of how I call it a symbolic prediction, right? So let's go. Um, so I, I kind of hope I can stop this. So it says here, out of one of them, five. So it says, out of one of them, and this is now 
the King James Version. Is that all right? So it begins by saying, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, thank you, out of one of them, out of which one of them? The four kings or the four winds? Thank you, as winds, right? So it's basically saying, so out of the four winds of heaven, four directions of the, com of the compass. Right? Everybody okay with that? We begin to appreciate what the text is saying. Came forth a little horn. Well, the horn is Rome, right? Everybody okay with that? Because there's the same little horn that was used in Daniel chapter 7. And then remember the little um, slide we did that shows the parallel between chapter 2, 7, and 8. So this must be Rome. Everybody okay with that? And Rome indeed came out of the West. So that when you had the Greek Empire occurring, if you watch back on our and you look at where, oh, no, oh, we can move on. Right, if you look at on the map and you see where Greece is, and you look where Italy is, Italy is to the west of Greece. Is that okay? So out of the west came this power, which is Rome. And it said that it grew towards the south. Well, it starts to describe it here, so let's just let people go. Towards the south, the east, which is Greece, Asia Minor, and Syria, and towards the glorious land, which is Palestine. Are you okay with that? That is chapter 9. Did we? Chapter, nine, chapter 8, verse 9. So verse 9 of chapter 8. Thanks, Lisa. So have we, do we understand this verse a little bit better now? Huh? The pleasant land or the glorious land is Palestine. So it, it, I'll, I'll show you that on the map now. So the question is, what is the pleasant land? And we say that the pleasant land or the glorious land is Palestine meaning Canaan, where the Israelites operated, right? Did the Romans control Palestine? Yes. I told you when Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus ruled the world. Is that okay? And Pilate was a governor of the Roman Empire. Did it control places to the east as far as Syria? Yes. Did it go towards the south in Africa? Yes. So there were parts of northern Africa that were parts of um, the Roman Empire. I became launching parts of some of the battles with the Babylonian tribes, etc. Is that okay? We, we know that that is consistent. Everybody right with that? We, do I need to go that over again? Out of one of them, out of the four cardinal points, and this one is the, out of the west, came forth a little horn, the nation of Rome, and because we just using one descriptor for it, we know that it is covering both its civil as well as it really just political rule. Is that okay? The full incarnation, if you will. And it grew exceedingly great towards the south, the east, and towards Palestine. You know that already because we had done this diagram last week. And we said that if this is Greece here, and this is Syria and, and parts of Asia here, that is the east. This is Israel, which is Palestine, the glorious land. And this is Egypt, which is Northern Africa. Is that okay? So Italy is here. So here is a nation after the Greeks have um, ruled the world for a while, the four generals after Napoleon. You have a Roman nation that is coming out, if you will, from the West. And it is going towards the East, towards Israel, and towards south, which is Egypt. Everybody okay with that? Everybody all right with that? So we have this as a pure match for what we study. So basically, this verse is describing the ascension at the beginning of the Roman Empire. So we're all right so far, right? Let's keep going. The other one, the other one says, and right, I'll let one puppet and then we'll start, right? 
So it says, and it waxed great. So what are we talking about now? Side of small, but 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 um, verse ten of chapter eight is saying it waxed great even to the host of heaven. I want to stop there for a little bit and talk about that. When you hear the hosts of heaven, you're likely to think about angels. Aren't you? Or you're likely to think about somebody living in the stars. But I want you to remember that when David was going to battle with Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 7, chapter 17, when David was going to battle, he said, um, yeah, my slide is moving faster than I wanted to, yes. When, when, they, when he told, you can read it in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, he said to Goliath, I come to you on behalf of the host of God and the armies of God and the armies of heaven. Is that okay? And the, armies of, and the armies of Israel and the host of God. That was the term he used. So that terminology, host of heaven, is really meant to represent God's people upon the earth. Is that okay? Isn't that lovely? Isn't that lovely? When we accept Jesus Christ, he considers us as if we are in heaven already. And we know that because in John chapter 10, chapter 1 verse 10, it says, I have come that you might have life, remember that? And have it more abundantly. In other words, when the, when the disciples were saying, where's your kingdom? Jesus said, lo here, lo there, the kingdom of God is within you. In other words, a kingdom is a place where a king lives. And therefore, if Paul is saying that when I live, Christ lives within me, then my body becomes the kingdom of God. Is that reasonable? The host of heaven, as used in this verse here, is representing the people of God and those who remain faithful to God. Is that okay? And we are saying that there is a huge parallel when you look at how Dan David described who he was representing when he went to fight Goliath and the Philistines. Everybody right to that? So if you go back to 1 Samuel, as you are reading for this week, chapter 17, you would see references, right? So, that helps us, that is our legend for interpreting chapter, verse, I keep saying chapter, verse 10. So verse 9 told us that Rome will come out of the west, it will wax towards the east, towards the south, Egypt, and towards the glorious land. Verse 10 saying that even though it started off small from the west, it will wax great even to the host of heaven, vertical war. Those of you who are here from the beginning, we talk about horizontal and vertical war. A vertical war has now started. So that the Roman Empire will not only deal with its surrounding nations, but it will institute measures and mechanisms and practices that seem to defy God himself. But you are doing that? And that is, a, that is a, a very significant point that this chapter is making. Yes? It says that we'll, so if we accept that the hosts of heaven are the people of God, the Jews and the Christians will remain faithful to God, right? Then it then says that it will cast some of them, some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamp upon them, which really means he's going to persecute them. That's okay. Can Rome do that? All right, so casting to the ground is, is saying that he's trying to no longer make them citizens of heaven, but citizens of the earth. How could he not make them citizens from heaven? Because he's trying to turn them away from their belief in God. Is that okay? So the Roman Empire, which is historical, and the Roman Church, which is also historical, the Roman Church aligned church and state with the Roman Empire. And part of their um, machinery included severe persecution of those faithful believers in God. Everybody heard of that? 
And part of the persecution was because those people refused to accept the worship that they had introduced. And they also refused to accept some of the things that were being presented. And they were seen as heretics because they were not willing to worship the Bishop of Rome, which was the head of the church, and see him as a powerful thing. Now it's important to note that also civil Rome persecuted Jesus Christ. What do you remember that, right? The Romans are the ones who crucified Jesus. And therefore, both civil and religious political Rome persecuted God's people. Is that okay? That is why we could use the little one just to describe this, because it is covering everything. So let's go to the other one, and I won't try to stop it, because I look like I'm getting through that. Let's let it run. So verse 11 now, it says, Yea, he magnified himself against the prince of the whole. Right. The prince of the host. Who is the prince of the host? Jesus. Is that message for us? <laughs> right, so yes. It says it, he magnified himself against the prince of the host. And this is a reference that is used to represent Jesus also in the Old Testament text. So you can always go and dig that up. But when Joshua, for instance, was about to get into the battle of Jericho, he was visited by a man who had a man. And he said, I have come as the prince of the, as the captain of the army and the prince of the hosts. In other words, he was the one who was supposed to lead the people to battle. Is that okay? And the prince of the hosts, we interpret that to be Jesus. So Rome in its civil form, crucify Jesus. Are you right to that? You can, I mean, that might be a few little words right there, but that few little words capture what we wanted to say, right? Rome, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Rome got so big that they crucified God. But later on, after Jesus died, and Rome continued, they persecuted those who wanted to follow the true Jesus Christ. That happened in the early centuries. And then later on, by misrepresenting Jesus and his work in the heavenly kingdom, by introducing priests who could pay, you could pay to get your indulgences instead of going straight to God. By introducing Mary as an intermediary to Jesus, you then found that they were also magnifying themselves against the Prince of Hosts. Not physically now, but spiritually. Is that okay? All right, the next thing says, and by him the daily sacrifice. Now, there's a, a tricky one. Now, in the, in the Hebrew translation, all the linguistic people seem to say that that word sacrifice is not really in the translation. What is in there is daily. And the word that is trans, translated as daily is a word called tamid. T A M I D. And Tamir in Hebrew literally means continual. So, in really, in truth, in fact, it is saying that he magnified himself against of the prince of the host, and by him the continual was taken away. What is continual? Well, the original translators bring that word sacrifice because in the Jewish world, the only thing that was continuous were the daily sacrifices. Is that okay? Every day, sacrifices went up to God. Is that all right? We talk about that when we did the sanctuary services. So this is what they had represented. But I wanted to appreciate that continual daily sacrifices did not stop when Jesus died. So when Jesus died and the veil was torn from the top to the bottom, and it looked as if those sanctuary services were over. The continual representation, because that's what the sacrifice was about. It was getting the blood, and then the priests were going to the holy place and offer the blood on behalf of mankind. Is that okay? So what was really happening continually was somebody interceding for sinful man, 
before God and ask him for forgiveness. Is that okay? Each Jew who lived in those times of the temple, they walked around feeling liberated because they could look to the temple every day and see the incense going up and know that somebody was offering forgiveness for their sins. Is that okay? But when Jesus died, you know, Paul has a very interesting thesis on this in Hebrews chapter 4 and in Hebrews chapter 7. Chapter 7 is his best book. I can't read it all here. But Paul effectively says that priests died so they were not perfect in their sacrifice. And that they offered the blood of lamb and goats, which could not cleanse us from sin completely. But the true high priest is Jesus Christ. Who, was, who died once. That's what Paul says. These are the priests who died all the time because they live for some time, died, and the next one comes. But Jesus Christ is a high priest who dies once. And in dying once, he continues as our high priest, ever making intercession for us. Those are important chapters that you need to read in your spare time. Hebrews chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 7. Is that okay? So that what effectively this is suggesting is that the, the little horn, the Roman Empire, magnified itself against the Prince of Hosts, against Jesus Christ, literally by killing him upon the cross of Calvary, and then figuratively by attacking his role in the heavenly sanctuary. So that Paul, who was an apostle around Jesus, just after Jesus' time, Paul used to preach very clearly that we could come boldly before the throne of grace and find mercy. What did the church preach? The church says you can come to the priest, pay him your indulgences, confess your sin to him, and then he will carry your sin to the Father. I'm talking nowadays after Jesus had died. It's not sanctuary now. This is fundamental Roman Catholicism. Is that okay? So that the Roman Christian church introduce some measures that obscured the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. Is that okay? And you and I today, we need to give God thanks that we know, and that's why Luther, I, I keep going back to Martin Luther, because Martin Luther is the greatest uh, example of how this change came about. Luther was doing penance because the church had instituted penance. So when Luther felt sinful and he went, he was in a monastery and he went to the head of the monastery, the monk, and he said, how do I get away from this feeling I have that I am sinful and I am a sinner against God? And he told him how much Haley Mary used to see and how much passages to repeat. And he told him to go and wash the um, stairs of, a mon of the mon monastery. Of and he was already on his steps when Luther, who had who had by faith received a copy of the Bible and read it for himself, which was scarce in those days. Luther remembered Romans 1.17 that says, they just shall live by faith. And that's when he got up and he went and examined all the teachings of the church. And Luther in 1517 at the, at the gates and the doors of the church in Wittenberg, Germany, he, 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 he nailed 95 theses on the door that says, this thesis is suggesting that you are wrong in this area, in this area, in this area. And he found 95 of them. Is that okay? And that is the birth of Lutherism and Protestantism as we have it today. I'm suggesting to you that by instituting those 95 and others, the church had corrupted our view of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. And this is what it says here. By him, the daily sacrifice, which is a continual ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, and the symbol of it in the Old Testament, was taken away. So they took away, they, they obscured it, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. But this, was, this is clear because we know that in AD 70, the Romans destroyed the Jewish sanctuary in Jerusalem. AD 70 represented the destruction of Jerusalem. Is that okay? So this prophecy is fulfilled. And it is correct. So the, the, the Romans destroyed, this slide is reminding us that the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. 
But you ask yourself, if civil war, because the 70, is still civil war in the West. If civil war destroyed uh, the sanctuary in 70, what did, what did the Christian Rome do? To understand what the Christian Rome did, you need to remember the sanctuary services which I just went through with you. And know that all the language of Daniel chapter 8 is reflective of the sanctuary services. God gave the sanctuary services to impress his holiness and to help the people see how they can obtain salvation. Is that okay? Which I discussed with you before. So that the, the, Old, the Old Testament sorry, tells us that every priest was sinful and had to bring some sacrifices for himself and then he eventually died. But I want to go back to what Paul says. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14 to 16, so I'm giving you these. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. And in case he wasn't too sure who it was, he tells you, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. It's an important point because Paul is accepting that Jesus is now a high priest who understands humanity because he came and lived here as a man. Is that all right? But was in all points as that we are yet without sin. And he says, let us therefore come what? That's an important word. Paul is suggesting that human beings can come straight to Christ and ask forgiveness. You don't need to go through an intermediary. Is that okay? Come straight to Christ. Unto the throne of grace that we may find mercy and find grace in our time of need. So, um, Christ now ministers to us in our heavenly sanctuary. And this is where he told you about his, his um, conversation in chapter 7 of Hebrews chapter 7, where he told us that Jesus' service is a superior service to what is given in heaven. Is that all right? So, if you were to ask that question again, how did Christian Rome um, magnify itself against God's high priestly rule in the heavenly sanctuary? This is a slide we used a few weeks ago when we were discussing the Roman Christian church. And I told you that the Roman church, the Roman Christians introduced this thing about the umbrella of Christianity. Everybody, everybody to come in. It don't matter what you believe, just come in. We call all of you Christians. Is that all right? And so they got a lot of the barbarians to come in and join them, worship the sun, they which is the day of the sun, etc. Right? They, then they introduced this life after death and constant hell. And your soul is in hell through purgatory and you can pull it back. That is non biblical. Another one of the things that Luther challenged, if you will. They also gave us the sainthood of human beings and suggested that they are even after they are dead. They can become saints and you can pray to them and they will intercede on your behalf. We talked about the mother of Jesus. We talk about the role of the priest as an intercessor and selling off indulgences. And then we talk about the fact that they attempted to change times and laws by introducing the seventh day as a Sabbath. And then this one, transubstantiation, is an important one. There's a view within the, still practice within the church, the Roman. Catholic Church that suggests that during the communion service, when the, the priest utters certain Latin phrases, that the, the bread and the wine changes to the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. That might look like nothing. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And that's why sometimes I'm a little bit concerned if we become overly reverent during our communion services, because we are borrowing from that thinking that we are in the actual body and presence of what I've heard some Christians of our denomination talk that, and I have to always put it down. Because we don't believe that. We believe it is simply symbolic. The bread and the wine are symbolic of the blood and blood of Jesus Christ, but we cannot create God in our hands. Just to say that is blasphemous. And those are some of the things, right? And then the last one I wanted to we'll do before we close is verse 12. So, so verse 9 introduces us to Rome. Verse 10 told us it will wax great and towards the glorious land and direction, etc. Verse 11 talked about the fact that it will attempt to obscure the sanctuary. Is that okay? Verse 12 now. And the host, being the people of God, 
was given him, Rome, the little horn, against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, right? So, in other words, we know, and you know we talk about it 12, 60 years, that the Roman church and the Roman nation, the religious political Rome, they control and, and basically persecuted God's people for the better part of 1260 years. And even before that, if you had persecution, they followed, right? Um, so, and cast it down to the earth. So it cast true down to the earth. So that one is clear because we just described the fact that they didn't believe in the things that were in the Bible. Is that okay? So it cast true down to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. Nobody can argue that Rome grew to the, one of the most powerful nations on earth during this period. Is that okay? Are you all right so far? Ready for the last bit? So if we accept that, we are ready to deal with the interpretation. And that's what we'll pick up next week. Is that okay? So I'm saying to you that at this stage, Daniel sees in a vision what God has given. But in his vision on chapter 8, he is seeing something very special in that the war is more than just horizontal between nations, but the war is, um, is vertical and it goes against God's people. Is that all right? And that is a worrying thing. Let me, let me just conclude, if you will. Let us let you know the effect this had on Daniel. Because the end of the chapter it says, and the vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. Therefore, shut up the vision is the angel talking to Daniel now. And it shall be for many days. We'll come back to that. Verse 27, it says, I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterwards, I rose up and did the king's business. I was astonished at the vision, but did not understand. This was hard for Daniel. It was hard for him to accept that an earthly kingdom will arise that will affect God's people so drastically. And so I want to say to you today, that sometimes we take the truths of the Bible lightly. And we assume there's no big thing what you believe. But I want you to realize that even though Christian Rome or the, the Roman Christian church would have said some of the things that the true believers believe and talk about Jesus Christ, their perversion, I would their modification, their introduction of traditional ways of worship compared to what the Bible said, were viewed as terrible and dreadful by God. Is that okay? Didn't matter what good things Rome did. The fact is that Rome, together with the church, the state and the church, came together and perpetuated a system of religion that exists even today, that obscured, that changed the way the Bible speaks about man's relationship with God. And God saw that as very, very serious. Are you okay with that? To the extent that God intervenes. And therefore, I suggest to you that when we get to a judgment scene after this, the real issue of the judgment is who believed in this false doctrine and false religion or who believe in the truth of the Bible of Jesus Christ. And so it's important that when you examine your spiritual beliefs and your foundations, that you can make a beeline and a reference back to thus says the Lord. It's not about man. It's not about how good your past is or how charismatic he is, or how well he speaks, or how articulate he is. It's about whether what he says is in the Bible, and whether it is biblically based or not. Is that okay? And that is the basis of our salvation, and that is what keeps us together. I thank God that throughout this dark period of earth's history, 
when so much adjustments and modifications were going on to what God believed, that God still preserved the Bible. After 1798, and certainly after Protestantism by, by Luther, there was an explosion of the Bible. Today the Bible is all over the place. You go in a hotel and you can pull a drawer and find a Bible by the Gideon. You go on your Bible, Bible, gateway online and you find Bible. Bibles are all over the place. It's predominant. Nobody has an excuse. You can read for yourself and you can understand what God is saying to us and how he wants to bridge the separation between holy God and sinful man. And the only way to bridge that is by believing in Jesus Christ. End the story. If I, and there's the simplicity of the gospel because nobody thinks it's so simple. Nobody thinks, you know, I, I read the story once of a man who's got an estate and the estate was in a bad way. It was never bringing forth good fruit. It was always going through drama. Whenever it was harvest time, he had nothing to harvest. Was overgrown with shops and stuff. And he went to Obiaman. And he said to the Obiaman, I want a portion to throw on the land. I want you to say something to make it fruitful. And the Obiaman gave him four cans. And he said, Go to one corner of the land and light a candle. And then walk a straight line along the edge of the property until you get to the next corner and light the next candle. Then walk the next side, it was a rectangular property, of course. Go to the next side, light a candle, next and then come back to where it started. And as he believed that nonsense, and he took the candle and he went and he started to walk. As he lighted first and he started to walk, he saw two holes in the fence where some dog used to run in and destroy his property. And as he walked further on, he saw some crab hole where the crabs used to come in and eat his stuff. As he walked further on, he saw some termite nests. And by the time he lied the next guy, and he walked the next side, he saw some shops coming from the neighbor's side, pines that were coming and overcrowding his land. And by the time he got to the next side, he saw where the water had started to seep from the neighbor, and it was water logging his place. And he needed to put up a wall to fix it. And he realized what the Uber man was trying to tell him was that he didn't need no portion. He simply needed to mind his business and do the simple thing of looking into his property and making sure it happens. But we don't like the simple answers. So we want to do penance. We want to call out different names. We want to chant seances. And all God says is believe. That's all he says. Believe. Don't follow no pastor. Don't follow no priest. Don't follow no saint. You just believe. And then, if you believe, if you accept the fact that I died for you and you then accept my righteousness in your place, you will live for me. I don't have to ask you to do it. It's a natural response to Christ coming within us. Is that all right? And that is our prayer today that you'll understand the simplicity of God's gospel. Next week, we will finish this chapter by looking at verses um, 23. To 25 in much the same way that we looked at verses 8 to 12, I mean 9 to 12, and then the last thing we want to discuss is that 2,300 days, how long that is, and what period does it span. Is that okay? That'll be our conversation for next week. That's the end of today's session. I see one person coming in, I think. All right, so verse Somebody's asking in verse 11, where it says the daily sacrifice. If you can explain that again, let's just go back to that quickly. Right. Oh, it is not here. Let's bring it up, bring it up. Right. So let's talk about verse 11, right? It says, yes, he magnified himself even to the prince of fools. And by him, so I just read any white writing for now, right? So let's read it in one and then we come back and describe it. So he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. That's what he verse says. So 
We're going to expand it out a little bit. Now, I'm saying to you that maybe we just go with what the translation gave us for the first interpretation. So the King James Version says the daily sacrifice. And it really means that by him, meaning that by the little horn, by the Roman power, the daily sacrifice was taken away. That happened in two ways. The first way was that the Roman Empire destroyed the earthly sanctuary in Jerusalem in AD 70. Is that okay? So on the basis of that alone, that physical event, the Romans took away the daily sacrifices because they remove a place where the people could worship and observe and hold their sacrifices. But it should not have mattered because Christ had already died. Is that okay? Christ would have died in AD 31 so that we would have find that in AD, 30, AD 70, it is after Christ's death. Is that okay? But yet still, the fact that the Romans destroyed this place, the physical place and sanctuary, is strong enough evidence that it is representing what they did to that physical sanctuary service. Are we all right? The other thing we are saying is that when you read the Hebrew of this text, it really doesn't say daily sacrifice. It really says continual, meaning continuing present participle. Because that word tamid, that means daily, is a word that really means continually. So in other words, it is saying that by Rome, the continual was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. What is the continual? Well, the continual or the continual sacrifice or the continual thing that we know about is that every day, the only thing that was so continuous in the Jewish culture was the sanctuary service. And the fact that he makes reference to the sanctuary in the second half of the text gives us enough reliance to assume that he's talking here about the daily sacrifices. More than that, the use of ram and goat and all of that is sanctuary type typology. Is that okay? So that clearly chapter 8 is surrounding this whole sanctuary thinking. The continuous activity in the sanctuary was the morning and the evening sacrifices. And in truth and in fact, in the night you used to go and sleep. So what was continual? The, 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 the incense used to be going up all the time. The fire in the, in the altar of incense used to always be in the, in the yard used to always be lit. So people would see the smoke going up, etc. So that was a, 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 a representation that Jesus was constantly interceding on their behalf and he was always available for the sinner who sinned. Is that okay? When I discuss this with you, when we're doing this, I told you that the way the Jewish um, tabernacles were established, they were established in concentric circles, in the sanctuary in the middle, so that a believer in any of the camp of Israel who got up in the middle of the night and felt guilty for a sin could look to the sanctuary, see the burning incense going up, and know by faith that their sins could be forgiven. Is that okay? And therefore, the next morning when they go and they carry the alarm, etc., they are going by faith that God is there. So what this verse is telling us is that the Roman nation and the Roman nation in the form of civil Rome and then religious political Rome magnified himself against Jesus Christ, the Prince of Hoops, and, and cast down his daily sacrifice. Well, by AD 70, the daily sacrifice on earth was done. Because once Jesus died, daily sacrifices were done. So the only continual thing could be happening is Christ interceding on our behalf. Everybody okay with that? So when Jesus had to leave, he says, expedient for you that I go away. When I go, the Holy Spirit will come. But Jesus had to go. Because when he went, he now went into his heavenly Father. And that's why he told his disciples on the other road, you pray to the Father through me. So when we pray, we say in Jesus' name. Because we have an implicit understanding that Jesus is always interceding on our behalf. If you do anything 
That's why I spend so much time going through how we are saved and grace, etc. Because once you start to put uh, mechanisms between, and that's why the church should be really, really careful about some of our rituals and stuff because we don't want to stand between people and their salvation. You don't want to say, well, you must have the right clothing and the right look before you come into church. So the, the important thing is to suggest that if you start to put um, institutions and levels between the sinner and Jesus Christ in heaven, then basically you are casting down and taking away his role as a continual representation of the salvation. Is that okay? So this, 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 um, and that will be explained when we get to verses 23 to 25 because the interpretation from the um, angel himself went on to explain this even more to us. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? Yes, so the, the, the person is asking if by Roman priests taking away the role as mediator, did they attempt to take away the daily sacrifice? And the answer is yes. So, so in the slide that I know I, I kind of went over, a little bit fast. Let us put it back up again. Ooh, what did I do? Hold on, hold on. All right, so but this slide, we talked about here. Yeah, one of the things we said here was that um, the introduction of intercessory role of the priests penances and a selling of pardons that took on so the priest and that is that is consistent today so today in the Roman Catholic Church we are told that if we want to confess our sins we go to the priest not to Jesus to the priest and I know some people feel that we kind of misrepresent what the people believe because the priest really acts as an intermediary between yourself and God and helps you to unravel yourself with God that might be so yes but the doctrinal writings of the church says that you must go to the priest because the, the fires, we're not fire talking about Lord, the fires were called traveling priests who would move from tongue to tongue. That's how the church became so rich. They would go from tongue to tongue and they would basically sell forgiveness. That's what they were selling. And people would come and meet them and say, I'm sorry, and you say, go on, repeat a psalm, go on, do this, or I give you forgiveness. The priest was dispensing forgiveness. And still does some of that to me. So the fact of the matter is, doctrinally, the church would have adopted um, um, practices, religious practices, that obscured Jesus' role as a true mediator. When Paul says, come boldly before the throne of grace and find this. Amen? Okay. So we've covered a lot. We've made some long time here today. Um, so let's just, you know, first day back in church, but we've had a long, long run today. So let's bow our heads for prayer as we close off today's session. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for the messages you have given to us through your word. And more importantly, Lord, we thank you for being our God of heaven, who is willing to die for us, to satisfy the requirements and the wages of sin is death, but who has given us the gift of eternal life. God, help us never to obscure your work and what you're doing for us in the heavenly sanctuary. But where we remain faithful to you always, trusting you, allowing your spirit to and complete control. Guide us, protect us, and bless us. These are the mercies we do ask. In Jesus' most holy name. Amen. All right, amen, everyone. See you next week. Same time. Same place. Uh, those of you who wish to come in person, you'll have to follow our protocols. And those of you who wish to, um, to stay online, then you can do it online as well. Thank you all. Thank you all. We're still on YouTube and we're on Facebook. All right? All the best.